Welcome to my lecture number nine. Today we're going to talk about polymers. A chemicals made by living organisms. Polymers are large molecules. Therefore, we call them macromolecules. Macro means large. Biological macromolecules are divided into four classes of biopolymers. Number one, protein. Another word for proteins, polypeptides. You see? polypeptides, many peptides together, or many amino acids together. Proteins are made of amino acids. Carbohydrates, polysaccharides. Saccharide means sugar, poly many. So carbohydrates made of many simple sugars. Lipids. Lipids, this group include oil, fats, waxes, and steroids. What they are made of, we'll talk later on. Actually, I mean, uh, uh, some of this, uh, majority of them are made of glycerol and fatty acids. Steroids, though, is a very special group mm, in this, it is a very special subgroup in this large group. Nucleic acids. Nucleic acids uh, include DNA and RNA. We're not going to talk today about nucleic acids. We will, we will leave it when we will uh, cover unit on genetics. So today we will cover only three groups of macromolecules or biopolymers, such as proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. You see, some organic molecules are small and are called monomers. Mono means one, mere part. So molecules made of one part. The most simple organic compound is the gas methane. Methane is also called natural gas or swamp gas. A molecule of methane consists of one carbon and four hydrogen atoms. Monomers may be linked together to form polymers. Polymers can be extremely long molecules that uh, contain many monomers. What you see on this picture is a structural formula of a fat. It's tr triglyceride. So what you see here is a glycerol, the head of the molecule, and three tail of fatty acids. We will talk about this fatty acids later on during our lecture today. One way monomers link together is by a condensation reaction. In condensation reaction, monomers lose hydrogen and oxygen atoms which form water. This loss of these atoms opens bonding sites. Monomers can attach to each other at these sites. Because condensation reaction causes a loss of water from the monomers when they link together, these reactions are also called uh, dehydration synthesis reaction. Let's take a look at the dehydration reaction uh, by using more visuals. What you see on this slide is a diagrammic representation of a polymer. So you see a short polymer here. Please note, at one side it has a hydroxyl group, another side it has hydrogen. So we have hydroxyl group and hydrogen. Please do not confuse. Hydroxide ion with hydroxyl group, which students usually do. Now, hydroxide ion, as you remember, we talked about forms when a dissociation of sodium hydroxide occurs in water and it is charged. So, hydroxide is an charge ion or an ion, we can call it. Now, Whereas hydroxyl group refers to OH functional group without negative charge. And this group is bounded 
uh, has a covalent bond with the compound. Here you could see OH hydro or hydroxyl group. And here, these lines here represent covalent bonds. So every time you see a line, this is a covalent bond. All right, here what we have is a short polymer. Let's make this short polymer longer. Either it could be here carbohydrate or protein. So how do we make this longer? We will need a monomer subunit to attach to this short polymer. If this is a protein, the monomer is amino, would be amino acid. If this is a carbohydrate, the monomer is going to be a simple sugar. So we bring our monomer closer to the short polymer. What it will need for this reaction to happen, we will need to have enzymes. We're going to talk about enzymes, uh, which are proteins, later during the lecture. But now let's see what's happening. From the sh this short polymer, you see the hydrogen on one chain, and on monomer has hydroxyl group or H group. Now, these atoms combine together and live as a molecule of water. So now you understand why this is called dehydration reaction. DE means without, or in this case, losing, right? And what do we lose? Uh, hydro, hydro means water. We are losing water here during the dehydration reaction or dehydration synthesis or Another word, condensation reaction. Why condensation? Because two, um, because different atoms, they condense, they get attached to each other. And here we're ending up with a longer polymer. Now, why this happens? It's because monomers, they become ionized in an aqueous solution, like in a cytoplasm. Uh, and uh, two hydrogens form the uh, positively charged end of one monomer. They combine um, with an oxygen from negatively charged end of another monomer. Again, forming water, which is releases as a side product and again joining the two monomers with the covalent bond. Here is the covalent bond form, as you can see. Now question to everybody. From what you learned in the previous lectures, is a dehydration re reaction catabolic or anabolic reaction? Is this catabolic or anabolic reaction? Remember, we talked about two different pathways of metabolism. If you said that this is anabolic reaction, you are correct. Catabolic reaction, it's when we digest, we break down large molecules. In anabolic reactions, we build in up large molecules. So indeed, dehydration reaction is anabolic reaction. Now we're going to look at the catabolic reaction. Name of the catabolic reaction is a hydrolytic reaction or hydrolysis. So now, from now on, in biochemistry, every time you hear uh, to uh, hydrolysis or to hydrolyze something means to break. Right? Instead of saying breaking, we'll say to hydrolyze a molecule. Since we want to hydrolyze something, so here it is for you, longer polymer. Now we want to break it into a small subunits. What do we do? If you think of water, you are right. Hydro means water. So 
we're going to hydrolyze this molecule. This H2O molecule is going to get in between. And as a result, we're going to uh, end up with two different product, products. Short polymer and monomer. This is a product of this hydrolytic reaction or hydrolysis. Now we'll talk about uh, the first group of macromolecules called carbohydrates. Carbohydrates contain the following elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The covalent bond between carbon and hydrogen store a great deal of energy and uh, is easily broken by organisms. Aha, that's why we need food. So now you know, we eat, we consume organic compounds, so we can break the covalent bonds in between carbon and hydrogen, getting energy for our metabolic reactions in each of our cell. Carbohydrates are divided into three types, monosaccharides, mono one, saccharide sugar, monosaccharide, simple sugar, disaccharides, di two, they are dimetric carbohydrates, polysaccharides, polymetric carbohydrates, and here are examples of these three groups. What you see here is a monosaccharide, example given to you as a glucose, disaccharide, sucrose, another word for sucrose is stable sugar. Here it is, stable sugar, disaccharide, indeed it's made of two uh, uh, monosaccharides, two simple sugars together. Another example is lactose. Here, lactose is also disaccharide, as you can see, made of two sugars. And then we have polysaccharides, a biopolymer, right, made of many uh, simple sugars linked together. Monosaccharides and disaccharides are crystalline, soluble in water and sweet to taste. Monosaccharides and disaccharides have names ending on O-S-E, O's, ribose, glucose, arabinose, fructose, galactose, lactose. Now let's take a look at the reaction of dehydration that you're already familiar with. But we're going to look specifically at how to synthesize sucrose, a table sugar. So, look, to, to make up the sucrose molecule, we need glucose and fructose. Both of them are simple sugars. In fact, they even have the same molecular formula. Take a look, C2H12O6, both of them. But they are slightly different in the arrangements of their atoms. Now, what we will need, we will need an enzyme. Once I mention the enzymes that we're going to talk about later, enzymes are biological catalysts. What does catalyst mean? It means a chemical that speeds up uh, a biochemical reaction. Without enzymes, it will take long time for reaction to happen. Sometimes it could take a month for reaction to happen if there is no enzyme. But in the presence of enzyme, reaction happens quick in a split second. And we're ending up with a sucrose in this case, a table sugar. Since it is a dehydration reaction, what is released here, you remember, Water. Water is released from this biochemical reaction. The opposite reaction of dehydration is hydrolysis, or hydrolytic reaction. 
For example, we have here table sugar or any other kind of disaccharide. We add water and we end up with two monosaccharides. So reaction is catabolic. What we saw before was an anabolic reaction. Now let's take a look at the hydrolysis, which is catabolic reaction. So uh, here we have lactose, a milk sugar. In order to break it down, we will need a lactase. Lactase is an enzyme. Every time you uh, see ASE on the end of the word, that means it's an enzyme. This enzyme helps to break, break lactose into galactose and glucose. So we had a disaccharide that is now broken into two simple sugars, galactose and glucose. Some people uh, do not produce lactase. Obviously, these people starting to have uh, uh, problems every time they, ha they have milk products. And what happens, they end up with producing a lot of gas and diarrhea. So if this happens to you and for a long time you have in gas and diarrhea, you might want to make an experiment and stop taking milk products at least for two or three weeks. See if it helps. If all of a sudden uh, your symptoms buzzer, uh, that buzzer that used to bother you disappeared, that means that you actually have lack of lactase. Well, uh, instead of waiting that long, probably what you would like to do, uh, you would like to see a doctor. And I recommend you to see a doctor this time and ask him to test you uh, on um, your lactase enzyme in your body and see if uh, your body do not produce it and that's why you struggle with the symptoms. Always, if you have a chance, uh, reach out to your doctor. Do not hesitate. And here is a very simple representation of what we just talked about. Uh, hydrolysis, you see, hydrolysis breaks polymers down into monomers. Condensation and hydrolysis are two important reactions in the formation and breakdown of organic compounds in living things. We just talked about uh, dehydration uh, reaction and uh, uh, hydrolysis. Now let's take a look at the polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are not sweet and must be hydrolyzed before, uh, they, before being absorbed. Now, when they hydrolyze, then you taste sweet. Like, for example, if you have a starch in your mouth, it is a polysaccharide. You don't taste any sweetness. But if you do not swallow it down and keep it for a longer period of time, what happens actually? It's because it starts to get hydrolyzed. Simple sugar starts to release, and all of a sudden, you taste, have a sweet taste in your mouth. Why it happens? Because enzymes in your saliva start to break down this polysaccharide called starch. So digestion of, the, of some of the carbohydrates actually starts in our mouth before it gets into a uh, small intestines, because in the small intestines, that's where uh, carbohydrates uh, get digested, not in our stomach. So, carbohydrates, um, polys or polysaccharides we're talking about, made of hundreds of monosaccharides and even thousands of monosaccharides. Starch and cellulose are polysaccharides. They are composed of many glucose molecules. Cellulose in the, is the most abandoned organic, abundant organic compounds on Earth. Glycogen is another common polysaccharide. In humans, in human body, glycogen is stored in the liver and broken down into glucose molecules when the body sugar is low. Another important polysaccharide is a chitin. It is used by arthropods like insects to make 
their exoskeleton. We also, uh, the cell walls of the fungi are also made of chitin. Humans are unable to digest cellulose because the appropriate enzymes to break down beta acetyl links are lacking. Undigestible cellulose is a fiber which aids in the smooth working of the intestinal tract. That's correct. Uh, it is also called dietary fiber. Every time you heard dietary fiber, we're talking about uh, cellulose. Beta-glucose is a monomer unit in cellulose. As a result of the bond angles in, in, in the beta-acetyl linkage, linkage, cellulose is mostly a linear chain. That's what you see on this diagram. One after another, all in lines, layers. This is called, we call cellulose fiber, and here's a simple representation of this diagramic representation of this. And here you could see the structural formula. You see it says here N. There is many, many uh, units of simple sugar one after another, Glu which are glucose actually. Here is another polymer we humans cannot digest. That is chitin. Look at this. Now I'll give you a time look at the structural molecule of the chitin and see how different it is from a cellulose. Is there something that cellulose doesn't have? Please take a look. Yes, chitin contains nitrogen. Look at this. Nitrogen here, here, there, there. Remember before we said that uh, carbohydrates made of three types of atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, what is, uh, so chitin is an, ex is an exception from the rules. Chitin contains nitrogen. Cellulose is a main substance in the walls of plant cells, helping plants to remain stiff and upright. Humans cannot digest cellulose, but it is important in the diet as a fiber. Fiber assists your digestive system, keeping food moving through the gut and pushing waste out of the body. If you have low cellulose or low fiber diet, you more likely end up with constipation, uh, which is a bowel movement that is infrequent or hard to pass. If person uh, having constipation and still has low uh, fiber diet, that person more likely to develop hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are swollen ve veins in the lining of the anus. If person still has low uh, fiber diet and lacking cellulose in his diet, that condition can develop into a diverticulosis. Diverticulosis is the condition of having diverticula, out packeting of colonic mucosa in the colon because of the weakness of muscle layers in the colon. Here they are, diverticula on this diagram. You could see them out packeting, like little balloons. And that's where feces get stuck and obviously, then it will be hard to get to clean the colon, right, uh, from the feces. What are feces? Feces are 80% of feces are bacteria and 20% of undigested material. Diverticulosis actually is common in people uh, that are, are 60 years old and older. What is dangerous is diverticulitis. Every time you hear itis, you think of inflammation. It's when diverticula become inflamed. And uh, then uh, sometimes a surgical uh, involvement uh, has to happen. It could be dangerous. It's like you heard of appendi appendicitis, right? 
Now, appendicitis is an uh, inflammation of an appendix that we all have, a little uh, appendage there and, uh, uh, in our uh, colon. Now, uh, he look uh, at the diverticula as many of these kind of appendages. So as appendix, our uh, diverticula also can become inflamed. What is unusual is when young people ending up with diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Now that's very unusual, uh, but actually in our days, uh, when it happens, when it, parents do not give in uh, their child not enough vegetables, not enough fruits, uh, not enough uh, uh, fiber in the diet, and as a result, at age of, I even know, 18, 20 years old, they ending up with this condition, which is uh, which they should not have. That uh, diverticulosis is a condition of old people, not young ones. Another polysaccharide that we humans cannot digest, we already mentioned, it is a chitin, right? You already identified that it contains uh, what there. It contains nitrogen, right? Chitin is a long chain polymer uh, derivative of glucose and is characteristic component of cell walls of fungi, the exoskeleton of crustaceans and insects. Well. Uh, chitin is another good uh, polymer to have in a diet, even though we cannot digest it. We do not have enzymes to break the linkages in between the uh, um, simple sugars of the chitins. Uh, so, um, therefore, we cannot get any nutrients from mushrooms. Uh, our teeth uh, cannot break the chitin, unlike cellulose. Cellulose, our teeth can break. That's why we chew the food to squeeze out the nutrients, to squeeze out vitamins and minerals from the uh, plants and fruits. In case of mushrooms, no matter how much we chew, it's robbery like substance and we cannot get anything out of it. But it gives a, our good intestine a good exercise. Look, in order to uh, develop a good skeletal muscles, what do you do? You go to gym, right? Uh, well, in order to, to, to develop a good smooth muscles in walls of your intestines, it's a good idea to eat mushrooms, uh, which contain this uh, polymer, biopolymer called chitin. And here is a, a large uh, picture of, of the uh, uh, chitin. Uh, all uh, simple sugars linked to, together, forming these branching uh, fibers. So here are two undigestible uh, uh, carbohydrate polymers, cellulose and uh, chitin. Uh, now you could see that all uh, both of them are fibrous, though they are fiber arranged differently. In cellulose, here we could see a part of molecules of cellulose only is linear, and here is a part of the molecule of chitin that is branching out in different directions. Unlike cellulose and chitin, starch is digestible carbohydrate polymer. It is a carbohydrate commonly found in nature and one of the primary sources of food energy for human beings. It is regularly eaten in the form of wheat, rice, potatoes and other staple foods cultivated throughout the world. Let's take a look at another group of uh, macromolecules called proteins. Protein is in every cell in the body. Our bodies need protein uh, from the foods we eat to build and maintain bones, muscles, and skin. We get proteins in our diet from uh, meat, 
dairy products, nuts, and certain uh, grains and beans. Protein from meat and other animal products are complete proteins. This means they supply all the amino acids the body cannot make on its own. Most plant proteins are incomplete. You should eat different types of plant proteins every day to get all the amino acids your body needs. It is important to get enough dietary proteins, dietary proteins. You need to eat protein every day because your body doesn't store it in the way it stores fats and carbohydrates. How much you need depends on your age, sex, health, and level of physical activity. Proteins consist of the 50% of cell dry weight. They are made up of amino acid subunits. They are known to be the most versatile molecules. Their responsibility include number one, composition and shape of cells. Yes, this is one of the most obvious function, structural function. Number two, catalyzing reactions. Yes, uh, proteins uh, uh, catalyze reactions that are uses, usually typically used to accelerate the rate by which the specific chemistry proceeds. Enzymes are substance produced by living organism, which acts as a catalyst to bring about specific biochemical reaction. Enzymes can make a chemical reaction millions of times faster than it would have been without it. Many proteins are enzymes that catalyze biochemical reactions and are vital to metabolism. Another function is gene regulation. Gene regulation is the process of turning genes on and off. During early uh, development, cells begin to take on specific functions. Gene regulation ensures that the appropriate genes are expressed at the proper times. Gene regulation can also help organism respond to its environment. Function number four, nutrient procurement. Nutrient procurement refers to any substance required for the growth and maintenance of an organism. Proteins composed of a chain of numerous combinations of 20 amino acids linked together by dehydration linkages known as the peptide bonds. Peptide bonds are covalent bonds. We call them peptide to make it special. So every time you hear peptide bond, you know we are talking about bonds between amino acids, peptides, we're talking about proteins. A typical pro protein is made up of 300 or more, more amino acids, and the specific number and sequence of amino acids are unique to each protein. Rather like an alphabet, the amino acid letters can be arranged in millions of different ways to create words and an entire protein language. Depending on the number and sequence of amino acid, the resulting protein will fold into a specific shape. This shape is very important and it will determine the protein function. Every species, including homo, humans, has its own characteristic protein. So protein function depends on the shape of the protein. Protein shape depends on the sequence of amino acids. All amino acids have the following shared features. Number one. They have amino group. Here it is on this diagram. All of them have carboxyl group. Here it is. COOH called carboxyl group. And please, those lines here, remember, they do not represent the charge. They represent the covalent bonds. Then we have a central carbon right here and a side chain. Each amino acid has a unique side chain. That's what makes them different. So amino group, carboxyl group, central carbon, and a side chain. 
amino acids are subdivided, uh, subdivided based on the similarities of the side chain. And here is an attempt to classify amino acid, put them into a different groups. While I am reading the names of amino acids, look at the structure, structural formula of the amino acid and see what is special about it. What do you notice? We'll start with the first group uh, that is includes nonpolar aliphatic R groups. Glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, methionine, isoleucine. If uh, uh, you remember our previous lectures, you will have real fun looking at the structural formulas. So what did you notice while I was reading the names of the amino acid of this first group? Take a look here, we have uh, R group 1, R group 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What is, what is common among the, these groups? They are nonpolar. Do you see any charges? No, there is no charges. And you remember what nonpolar are. What does nonpolar? Are they going to be a soluble in water or not? This uh, R group hydrophilic or hydrophobic are those R groups. So what are they? Nonpolar, hydrophobic R groups they have. They are not soluble in water, right? Now, what does aliphatic means? Another thing, did you notice? These carbon chains we have, right? They are not cyclic like this one, proline here, we can see a cyclic R group, right? Or they are not aromatic like here, for example. They are in a line, in a chain. So that's what we call aliphatic groups. Now let's take a look at the second group here that is labeled as polar and charge R groups, right? It's because polar and charge R groups. That's correct. They are not uncharged, but they are polar. What does this mean? Remember polar? Remember about the electrons and slight charges? Yes, they are not charged but they have slight charges. They carry slight charges, so that's what makes them polar. So let me read the names and you looking at this, uh, you will look better uh, and you will take a better look at the structure. Serine, threonine, cysteine, proline, aspergine, glutamine. You see, most of them have oxygen. And you remember what oxygen does, right? It pulls the electrons. So no wonder those R groups will have slight charges. Except look at the proline. That is strange. Why proline is in this group? Proline will not be polar molecule, right? Here is the proline. It's a cyclic R, it has a cyclic R group also. So um, I wonder why the proline been put into this group. It shouldn't be here, okay? Because it is actually, uh, Nonpolar. This has a nonpolar uh, R group. Now I'm going to read the next group, the amino acids of the next group lysine, arginine, hestidine. Did you take a good look at them? Those uh, Amino acid contain positively, positively charged R groups. Look at this. You see positive charge here, here, and here. Nitrogen, right? And here. 
amino group here is positively charged. Well, what does it tell you? The R groups are ionic. So this amino acid have ionic R groups. Aspartate, glutamate, those have negatively charged R groups. They are also ionic. So both uh, amino acid, lysine, arginine, uh, histidine, aspartate, and glutamate, they are all has they have all ionic uh, R groups. The last group here is non-polar aromatic R groups. So you understand why they called aromatic because uh, they have uh, this aromatic rings. So their R groups are made of aromatic rings. Therefore, they called uh, aromatic. Uh, I mean, th th therefore they are uh, uh, put into separate group from others, right? Very interesting, isn't it? Phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Those amino acids contain aromatic groups, R groups. Since now we know what proteins are made of, they're made of 20 different amino acids, now we're going to take a look at the protein structure overall protein structure, and there is four of them. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Now, primary structure is just a simply a sequence of amino acid, one amino acid after another. In a large part, it's in a large part determines the other protein features. So it's de the shape determines actually the function of the protein. And here what I mean, meant by this, let's take a look at the primary uh, structure. Primary structure means a sequence of different amino acids. And I shade it with different colors, each of the amino acid to show you that different amino acid make up this chain. And what do you see here on the end? carboxyl group, right? Carboxyl group. And here you could see the amino group. And the lines, of course, represent the covalent bonds. Now, secondary structure, because what happens um, with all these amino acid in chains? Well, they because of the interaction of, between each of the amino acids, they will determine the secondary structure of the protein. It could be either uh, helical, as you could see here, helix, right? Helical structure or plated structure. Then we have tertiary structure. Then all of this, again, because of the interaction of amino acids, it's, the protein could be folded in a ball. We call these proteins globular proteins. Not all proteins are globular, but yes, we have globular proteins. And that's what we refer as a tertiary structure. Uh, part of the uh, tertiary structure could have a secondary structure, right? There could be either helical portion of the molecule or it could be plated portion of the molecule. And then we have a quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is determined when we have a couple of tertiary structures together. Like, for example, in a molecule of hemoglobin. What you see here is a hemoglobin molecule, right? So four of these globular proteins, they are bound together. So the primary structure is actually determines all other structures in the protein because primary structure is a sequence of amino acids.
Now let's take a look at the secondary structure. You see, primary structure uh, falls into a new configuration, and it could be a helical structure like this. What keeps this helix together is the bonds that form in between different sides of the molecule. You could see him, them right here, hydrogen bonds. Look, there is a hydrogen bonds formed there throughout the whole molecule, and that's what turns it into a helix. That's what this kind of structure we call helix. Because of the uh, sequence of amino acid, uh, uh, the structure could be plated structure, like what you see here is a, a beta uh, sheet, a beta sheet. You see the beta sheet has sides that form hydrogen bonds with each other, and that's what keep it together. Hydrogen bonds is the weakest bonds as we discussed, but if there is many of them, it can form a very strong uh, structure. For example, the a spider web is a stronger than a steel, and it's all held together by the hydrogen bonds. What you see here is a very simple representation of the protein. You see, each of the circle represents an amino acid. And look, because different groups are sticking out from each of the molecule, the whole thing is twisted now. And here is the groups that actually responsible for this uh, twisted form. So what happens, there is different bonds are forming in the molecule. And what do we see here? We see hydrogen bond. We see ionic bond right here. Look, there is a charge uh, here on amino group, all right? And here oxygen negatively charged, has a negative charge. Now, we will see disulfide bond forms right here. Two sulfurs forming a covalent bond. Here you see hydrophobic interactions that keeps this area of the molecule together. Not to say about hydrophilic interactions, because biological systems are aquatic systems. Uh, and of course, each of the cytoplasms contains a lot of water. So each cells, um, in each cells, we have proteins which shape also determine by hydrophilic interaction with the environment of the cytoplasm. Quaternary structure of the protein. Here you could see two four globules together. And uh, what is in side there in the hemoglobin molecule? Each of our red blood cells filled with them. You could see iron here. The whole thing we call heme. Heme group is in there. You could see the polypeptide chains here and oxygen binds here, right? So bound oxygen in this area right here, you could see the oxygen molecules bound to the heme group, which contains iron right there. This is a typical quaternary structure of a protein. So the shapes of the proteins in our body is very important. Uh, if, it's go if protein is going to change its shape, it might become inactive and unable to prefer all its function. How the shape is important, I want to demonstrate you on the example of enzymes. So here you could see, you see a uh, diagrammatic rep representation of an enzyme and substrate. Enzymes are very special group of proteins that are made in cells. Enzymes are organic catalysts, chemicals that alter the speed of chemical reactions but remain unchanged themselves. Enzymes are very specific in their activity. Each en enzyme 
causes only one or a few reactions to occur. The enzymes to work, for enzymes to work, they must bind to a structure. A substrate is a reactant the enzymes affect. When an enzyme and a substrate combine, the product is called an enzyme substrate complex. As the substrate binds, the enzyme slightly change its shape. And voila, products are living active site of enzyme. So we started with a substrate right here. That's how it looked. And on the end, after enzyme, uh, after the binding to an enzymes, it's changed. We have new products here, different from the substrate. But please remember the beauty of this. Enzymes are catalyst, meaning that they make reaction go faster, but the enzymes themselves are not altered by the overall reaction. This is important to keep in mind. Many students forget this. So what we learn is that proteins must have specific shape to have proper function. Environmental condition can break bonds with the proteins. This will cause shape change. Shape change causes protein to stop functioning. The denaturation is a process in which proteins or nucleic acids lose the quaternary structure, tertiary structure, and secondary structure within present in their native state, state by application of some external stress or compound such as strong acid or base are concentrated in organic salt or organic solvent. Denaturation can be reversible or irreversible. What you see here is a protein denaturation. Here we have active protein. We rise temperature to boiling point 100 Celsius. And what happens? Protein unfolds. Why does it happen? Because the bonds that keep uh, the active protein or protein here, right? The that keeps the shapes are broken with the increase of temperature. Such bonds as hydrogen bonds, uh, ionic bonds, covalent bonds. Remember the uh, disulfide bridges, um, hydrophobic interaction, all of this now is uh, ruined by the high temperatures. What is the high temperatures? Right? Temperatures determine the movement of molecules, right? The faster they move, the higher the temperature. So obviously, if they move very fast, they bump into the structures. So what happens to a globular protein? It unfolds and becomes linear. You all know that an egg, uncooked egg, is fluid if you break it in there. Why? Because the molecules, they are globular like this. So they are moving, right, On this, in these directions. So they are fluid. Now, then what do you do? Some of you like to have a cooked eggs or boiled eggs. You boil an egg, and what happens? The structure becomes solid. Why this happened? because all the bonds we mentioned before are broken. So the globular pro protein is unfold. We're dealing with a linear structure. So each molecule, one next to each other, like soldiers in the line, that's what makes the structure solid. Linear molecules, they're not globular anymore. And this type of denaturation, of course, as you all know, is irreversible. You cannot make a solid boiled egg and turn it back into what it was before. Lipids are a large class of compounds that are insoluble in water. Lipids include fats, phospholipids, and steroids. They contain the same elements as carbohydrates, that means carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But in lipids, the proportion of oxygen is much lower than in carbohydrates. 
Within the body, lipids function as an energy reserve. They regulate hormones, they transmit nerve impulses, they cushion vital organs and transport fat-soluble nutrients. Fat uh, in food serves as an energy source with high caloric density. Adds texture and taste and contribute, contribute to satiety. Naturally, you will ask, what does calorie density mean? It is simply the measure of how many calories are in a given weight of the food. For example, one pound of donuts contains 2,000 calories, making it a calorically dense food item, compared to one pound of grapes, which contains 306 calories. The chart on front of you uh, provides you exa with examples of food items and number of calories per pound. A typical individual eats the same weight in food at each meal. Therefore, one can eat a larger amount of low calorie dense foods than high calorie dense foods for the same amount of calories. Subsequently, uh, continuing foods with a lower caloric density will allow us not only to eat as much or more food, but reducing caloric intake as well. Mostly of these low calorie dense food items like fruits, vegetables, whole grains and beans can be high in satiety due to the amount of fiber. These foods also have high water content which of course does not contain any calories. Lastly, they are packed with the most nutrients, including vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. You see here food before getting hydrolyzed uh, in our stomach and our intestines. What will be hydrolyzed in the stomach are meats, right? So that's what get digested actually in our stomach. The rest of the food such as oil, cheese, potatoes, rice, beans, fruits and vegetables, they will be digested in the small intestines, not in the stomach. And then after hydrolysis, anabolism is going to take place and uh, our body will start build up large molecules from smaller subunits that it's obtained from the food into in the process known as you all remember dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction so and here it is familiar to you dehydration reaction so how do we make fat we take fatty acid, glycerol, put it together, lose uh, water, and we ending up with fat. Now, the reverse reaction, of course, is called hydrolysis of fat, and this will yield what? Fatty acid and glycerol. And now let's get more specific and take a, a good look at the structural formula of glycerol and, um, and uh, um, fatty acids. Uh, glycerol is trihydric alcohol because it contains uh, three, uh, three hydroxyl groups right here. You could see them OH, OH, OH. And here we have fatty acid molecule. Now, Take a look at the molecule and see what is special about it. Remember, in inorganic chemistry, we said that it's easy to see which, uh, 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 which substance or which chemical is acid by looking at the structural formula. It starts with H. Well, in organic chemistry or in biochemistry, actually, uh, it's not that simple. You have to look at the structural formula and look at the, uh, if there is a CO. OH group present. This group is known as carboxyl group. If you see carboxyl group, it is an acid. That's what we call fatty acid, what you're looking at now, because it has carboxyl group right here. Now, to build up a fat molecule, we need more than just one fatty acid.
and of course more than two fatty acids. Note they have to face them uh, with a carboxyl group facing the glycerol. So here we have three fatty acids with a carboxyl group facing the glycerol molecule. And here it is dehydration synthesis and all its beauty. Look what happened. Here we had a glycerol with a hydroxyl group facing carboxyl groups of the fatty acids. So um, OH is living now with uh, oxygen from the carboxyl group of each glycerol. They are removed as three water molecules and we ending up with a humongous molecule of triglyceride. Here it is, fat molecule. Uh, it has head, which is part of the glycerol, right? And three fatty acids attached to it now. Human bodies can convert uh, glucose in foods to triglycerides. Triglycerides serve as one of the body's main source of energy. If the body does not require the energy straight away, it stores glycerides as fat. So triglycerides a glycerol molecule with three fatty acids attached. Triglycerides are the most common form of dietary fat. Now, which contains these fatty acids. And let's take a look at the fatty acids. What are they? A long chain of carbon ions surrounded by hydrogen atoms. Fatty acids differ from each other depending on their chain length, number of carbon atoms, and level of saturation, which means double bonds. Fatty acids are classified as saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated depending on the number of double bonds. Here in these molecules, you see that this uh, uh, tail of the molecule is saturated. There is no double bonds in here, so it's a straight molecule. Another straight molecule is here, another saturated fatty acid. But this molecule has a double bond, which creates kink in the molecule. That is monounsaturated fatty acid. Mono means one, so it has one double bond in here. You see, saturated fatty acids, they are like soldiers, as I said, they are uh, linear molecules, they are straight in one line, and therefore they form solid structures. Uh, what are saturated fats that you know that are solid? Butter, coconut oil, then what? Palm oil, right? Lard, this is all saturated uh, fat. Fatty acids of saturated fat contain single covalent bonds between atoms. They found in meats, whole milk, cheese, butter, eggs, uh, and as I said, coconut oil and palm oil. Saturated fats are, though, they known to rise cholesterol. How true it is, we'll see later on. Now, they are loaded with hydrogen. They are highly resistant to oxidation. This is a good thing. So why is it a good thing? Well, we'll talk about cholesterol for, oh, first, and then we're going to talk about the, their resistance to oxidation. Question number one, why is a nutritionist advice to limit the consumption of foods high in saturated fats? because our liver cells transform saturated fats into a cholesterol. For this reason, the best way to reduce cholesterol level may be to consume fewer saturated fats. Cholesterol is a waxy, fat-like substance that is found in all cells in your body. Your body needs some cholesterol to make hormones, vitamin D, and substances that help you to digest Food. Your body makes all the cholesterol it needs. High density lipoprotein, HDL, uh, is considered good 
cholesterol because this type carries bad cholesterol away from the arteries. Low density lipoprotein, LDL, is considered bad because it can build up on the walls of the arteries forming fatty deposits known as plaque. Plaque can be referred uh, to as clots, which can cause people health problems. Over time, high levels of bad cholesterol can build up on the walls of the blood vessels. The bad cholesterol can create clots and make it difficult for blood to flow through where your body needs it. Sometimes these clots can block one's flow, leading to a devastating heart attack or stroke. For these reasons, nutritionists advise limiting the consumption of foods high in cholesterol. So which foods contain high level of cholesterol? Everything that tastes good. Animals-based foods such as egg yolk, red meat and cream, shellfish such as oysters, mussels, crab, lobster and clams. Squid contains the highest amount of cholesterol among other seafood. But the question now, does most of the cholesterol come, come from our diet? And the answer is no. You see, recently scientists find out that most of the cholesterol in our body doesn't come from consuming it directly. The cells of our liver produce almost 90% of the circulating cholesterol. So some of us are naturally predisposed to a higher level of cholesterol that causes a, a, a problem in the body, including high blood pressure, uh, formation of plaques and thrombs in our um, arteries. So it doesn't depend on the diet that we eat use or should i say it almost doesn't depend on the diet that we use and here we are on our previous slide uh, so what we talked about is about cholesterol but i promised you that we're going to um, discuss what does oxidation means and what does highly resistant to oxidation means so saturated fats it says here they are highly resistant to oxidation. Oxidation occurs when an atom, molecule or ion loses one or more electrons in a chemical reaction. Oxidation doesn't necessarily involve uh, oxygen. Originally, the term was used when oxygen caused electron loss in a reaction. The modern uh, definition is more general. During oxidation reaction, free radicals form. Free radicals are unstable atoms that can damage cells, causing illness and aging. They are highly reactive and readily attack and steal electrons from other molecules. Free radicals are compounds that can cause harm if, if their levels become too high in our body. Uh, they are linked to multiple illnesses, including diabetes, heart disease and cancer. Your body has its own antioxidant defense to keep free radicals in check. Uh, Harboxyl uh, radicals and other radicals can virtually damage any kind of macromolecules, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids and amino acids. But the most dangerous when they uh, actually damage the uh, uh, nucleic acids, such as DNA molecules. This can turn many cells in our human body malignant. Uh, therefore, free radicals, they are, uh, the, the, therefore, the substances that contain many free radicals known as cancerogens, cancer-causing substances. What makes the free radicals dangerous, of course, is the free electron. You could see it here, right? When oxygen especially loses its electron, it will destroy, ruin anything around it unless it gets what it wants. And the more what it wants, the more wants the most is the electron. Uh, now, uh, there is the good news, though. There is many of these 
uh, particles, not only hydroxyl radicals, but many other uh, radicals that lose their electrons. And they do a great deal of harm uh, to us humans. Uh, though there is a good guys that um, sort of able to neutralize them and provide the free radicals with an electron. You want electron? Here it is. So what are those philosopher molecules that are so wise and generous to share their electrons with the free radicals? We call them, you heard these names, antioxidants. That's why you hear antioxidants are good for you, because they provide to these violent, aggressive particles, they give them what they want. They give them their electrons. So all fats and oils can be oxidized to form uh, from exposure to light, air, or heat. And they uh, become oxidized to form free radicals, which is not obviously good. But look at this, saturated fats, they are highly resistant to oxidation. That means they do not form uh, many free radicals when we you uh, cook using this uh, type of um, uh, fats. So now we'll learn that saturated fat do not form a lot of free radicals, even when uh, we cook and temperatures are high. But there is other fatty acids. Uh, let's take a look at those ones. We have fatty acids that contain double bonds, those called unsaturated fats unsaturated fatty acids. And here there are three types of fatty acids. Saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. You could clearly see which is which by looking at the structural formula. Here we have saturated fatty acid. Acid because it has carboxyl group, you see? COOH, carboxyl group. The molecule is straight. Each carbon is by, bound to hydrogens. There is no hydrogen missing here, but molecule below, look, the hydrogen is missing here. Therefore, the carbon has to have a bond with another carb carbon once again. So double covalent bonds is here present. There is a kink in the molecule and that's why we call it monounsaturated fatty acid. Uh, the molecule below a polyunsaturated acid, obviously, why? Because it has more than one double bond in here and more than one kink, right? The molecule is not straight here. Uh, olive oil and canola oil are monounsaturated fat. They are highly resistant to oxidation. Another good, um, uh, good um, characteristic, right? Uh, still, they do create more free radicals if we compare them to saturated fats, but still not as much. So they are safe to use when we are cooking, when we uh, uh, fry things. Uh, uh, this is probably one of the best compared to other oils, because what we're going to look next will be polyunsaturated fats, fish oil, safflower, sunflower, corn oil, cottonseed oil. All of those are fragile oils. You see, the bad thing about them, they most easily oxidize. They create free radicals easily. You don't want to use these oils if you decide to do um, uh, deep frying or any kind of frying in this. In some restaurants, they use and reuse them over again. Not a good idea because what people consume is a lot of free radicals, cancer causing chemicals, radicals that ready to destroy uh, anything around. However, we shouldn't get paranoid because there is always there will be antioxidants, hopefully, right? So when you eat something fried, make sure that you have um, a tomato that is full of antioxidants or you have berries or green peas that has many antioxidants, right? All of these things can Balance your meal. That's why we say your meal has to be balanced. A little bit of everything and everything in moderation. This is the main diet we should follow, right? A little bit of everything and everything in moderation. Make sure your 
uh, lunch, your dinners, uh, uh, not just consist of one thing, like only carbohydrates, or for example, only meat, right? Make sure your plates always have uh, vegetables, fruits, um, um, uh, broccoli has a lot of antioxidants, right? What else gives you a lot of antioxidants? Um, uh, any kind of, um, we'll see, uh, berries, right? Uh, green tea gives you antioxidants. Make sure that you are not just consuming fried food full of these dangerous radicals. And maybe, maybe it is a good idea to eat French fries with ketchup, right? Tomato that is full of uh, antioxidants. Now, French fries has a lot of free radicals because it's been boiled, who knows in what oil for how long it's been boiled there for you, right? But here you can balance it by eating and ketchup as an antioxidant. Much better idea, I think, that they have in Europe when they, instead of uh, dipping the French fries in uh, ketchup, they dip it where? In mayonnaise. A bad idea. The worst oil to use for frying, perhaps, is a sunflower oil. That's really uh, oxidized easily. Uh, and maybe, perhaps, perhaps uh, the area I'm coming from where they love sunflower oil, they use it everywhere. They fry on him, they do many things with it. Uh, maybe the, the, there is a high incidence of cancer because of this factor. Uh, but who knows? Look, free ra we don't know everything about free radicals, right? We don't know everything about the uh, foods, not yet. A good thing about polyunsaturated fat is that they are actually low cholesterol. So that is why it's a good thing to include them in our diet, but not uh, in a frying pan, but in our salads. So that's not a bad idea, perhaps, right? Now it's time to take a look at another group of lipids. This group called phospholipids. They're the major, major components of a cell membrane. Like fats, they are composed of fatty acid chain attached to a glycerol backbone. This molecule seems to have a double personality. On one hand, it is a polar, the head of it is polar and soluble in water, which means hydrophilic. But the tail's fatty acids are non-polar and insoluble in water. Uh, that means hydrophobic. So on one hand, molecule is hydrophilic, on another hand is hydrophobic. We call this uh, kind of molecules antipathic molecules. So indeed, phospholipids are antipathic molecules. So what do you think will happen to these molecules if we put them into water? Think, they have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. So what will happen? Here it is. In water, they form phospholipid bilayer. You see, bi, because it comes in two layers. The tails are hidden from water inside because the tails are hydrophobic. So it forms a hydrophobic cores. All cell membranes have hydrophobic core made of the fatty acids of phospholipid molecules. Outside their heads are turned towards the water though. You see, here it is with their phosphate groups. It's turned to water. Soon we will discuss uh, cell organelles and cell structure. So that time we're going to look at the how phospholipids assembled in the cell membrane. But for now we have to start with another group called steroids. Steroids are also considered to be lipids, but they have a carbon skeleton of four connected rings, no glycerol here. 
the different properties of different steroids are due to the attached functional groups. A steroid is a biologically active organic compound with four ring arranged in a specific molecular configuration. Steroids have two principal biological functions as an important component of the cell membranes, which uh, alter membrane fluidity, and as a signal in molecules. Hundreds of steroids are found in plants, animals, and fungi. Cholesterol is a steroid. Cholesterol is referred to as an amphipathic molecule. That is, it contains hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. The hydroxyl group in sterol is aligned with the phosphate head of the phospholipid on the cell membrane, which the rest of the cholesterol goes with the fatty acids of the membrane. It is very important that cholesterol is present on all the cell membrane due to its properties keep the cell firm and void being overly fluid. Interestingly, when temperatures are going, diet, uh, going down, animal cells, because of the cholesterol, are still keep fluid. You have to remember that if cell membrane solidifies, cell will die instantly. Our cell membranes have to be fluid. And that is what is the main responsibility of the cholesterol in our cells or membranes to keep them uh, either firm when at a regular room temperature in warm environments and keep them fluid in cold environments. Cholesterol is a steroid that can be modified to form many hormones. The human body makes 100% of the cholesterol needed for our body. There is no need to eat another animal to obtain any cholesterol. As the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies has stated, all tissues are capable of synthesizing enough cholesterol to meet their metabolic and structural needs. Consequently, there is no evidence for biological requirement for dietary cholesterol. That statement highlights that the human body can eat a whole food plant-based diet and still make 100% of the cholesterol needed for the structural integrity of all its cells. What you see on this slide is the cholesterol and its derivatives, such as testosterone and estrogen. Both testosterone and estrogen are sex hormones. Sex hormones are chemical substances that act like messenger molecules in the body. After being made in one part of the body, they travel to other part of the body where they help or control how cells and organs do their work. Testosterone is an adrogen, or with, which is a male sex hormone that plays a role in reproduction, growth, and maintenance of a healthy body. Cells in men's testes called Leydig cells take a cholesterol from the blood and turn it into testosterone. In women's bodies, uh, testosterone is produced in the ovaries, adrenal glands, fat cells, and skin cells. Generally, women's bodies make about one tenth and one twentieth of the amount of testosterone in men's body. Most females do not develop male characteristics because testosterone and other androgens uh, act uh, differently in their bodies, being quickly converted to estrogen, a female hormone. Estrogen is the main female sex hormone, while testosterone is a main male sex hormone. Males have estrogen too, but in smaller amounts. Estrogen plays a key role in male sexual health. It helps modulate sex drive, erectile function, and sperm production. Estrogen plays an important role in the normal sexual and reproductive development in women. The women ovaries make most estrogen hormones, 
though the adrenal glands and fat cells also make small amounts of the hormone. So what did I just said? What are functions of estrogen and testosterone in a human body? Think about it. They are among the primary molecules that direct and regulate sexual development, maturation, and sperm and egg production. In both males and females, estrogen influences also memory and mood, among other traits. You might wonder why some athletes often take synthetic variation of testosterone. The answer is, it is because testosterone has numerous effects, one of which is to stimulate muscle growth. Therefore, athletes often take synthetic variants of testosterone to increase their muscularity. What are the side effects of the testosterone supplements? Well, extreme aggressiveness, known as also as a road rage, high cholesterol levels circulating in the body, and therefore, and therefore high blood pressure. Now, and another one is the cancer in long-term users. No wonder that nearly all athletic organizations have banned the use of testosterone supplements. So what the main things about steroids? They have no glycerol, they have no fatty acids, they classified as the lipids because steroids are insoluble in water. We look at the examples of cholesterol and sex hormones, and on this our lecture is come to end. It was a very brief introduction into our biopolymers, which is, as you can imagine, is a huge topic that could be covered during the semester loan. But we do not have much time, so here is I, I provided you with some uh, brief um, basics of the material. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.